Gano Rap Radio. Raw and uncut. Cubo, and welcome to Chicano Rap Radio. I'm your homie Snipes holding it down. And today we have the privilege of talking to Antonio Pelayo. So without further ado, let's check in with the homie and see how he's been doing. And let's talk a little bit about who he is as a person. And let's talk about his work. He has a lot of things going on. Some of you might have attended his most recent event. Um, he had La Buya. And prior to that, he had El Velorio. Uh, I was there, definitely had a lot of lot of fun there. So without further ado, let's welcome him to the show. Good morning. How are you doing today, Antonio? Good morning. Good, good. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to, uh, you know, uh, motivated and inspiring people uh, like, like yourself. Um, you uh, have been, you know, in the art world, you know, uh, I think from, from a young age, you know, and you have a lot of, uh, seems like some of your artwork, uh, I think that's uh, El Conejo, you got El Fud, I mean, you have a lot of artwork behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get into that, give me a little background information. Uh, who's Antonio Pelayo and how did you become your current version? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think I started drawing uh, since I was like two years old. And uh, my, you know, my early memories of me doing something um i was probably two three years old uh, we used to live in highland park and uh this one time I, I went to the supermarket with my mom and i saw when we were on our way out i saw a magazine on the stand that had superman on the cover mm -hmm. and i it just attracted me and i just grabbed it when we got home my mom was like dude where, where'd you get this and i'm like you know I don't even remember what I said, but she, she let, let me keep it. And I drew the cover and my parents were so impressed that they continued, um, uh, encouraging me to draw. And then, oh. and then it got to a point where I was drawing stuff and then my parents would send it to their parents in Mexico. Um, and then when I entered preschool, which was right across the street from us, um, that was, all we did was art, drawing, painting, doing all kinds of arts and crafts. When that was over, uh, my teacher came over to my house and she was having a conversation with my mom and I was, I was there present. And I remember her telling my mom, you know, when this kid grows up, he's going to be an artist. So that was uh, like the earliest memory that I have of me like doing art. Uh, once I entered kindergarten and, and uh, from first grade uh, to fourth grade, my teachers would take me around the older kids, showing them my uh, drawings and uh, telling them, look, he can draw better than you, like to the oh, sixth wow. <laughs> Yeah, so, so that had a big impression on me. Then we moved to Mexico uh, when I was uh, starting the fourth grade uh, for religious reasons. My, my mom started uh, studying with the Jehovah Witnesses, so she became a Jehovah Witness. My dad didn't agree with that, so he sent us to El Rancho, uh, in Mexico, where his idea was to uh, have the pressure of the family, uh, have my mom go back to being a Catholic, uh, because everyone in, in, in this in this rancho, everybody was Catholic, and we were the only Jehovah Witnesses there. But instead of my mom coming back to being a Catholic, she just became a, a stronger Jehovah Witness, and she pretty much like recruited twenty percent of the of the family. Wow. So then we, we lived in Mexico for about 10 years. Uh, and in Mexico, being a Jehovah Witness, you're not allowed to associate with anyone that's not a Jehovah Witness. So what I did most of my time was just, you know, lock myself in a corner of a room and draw. So that mm -hmm. was my my thing to do over there. Right. Besides, right. besides working in the field and, you know, making money for the household. No, uh, just just real quick, I wanted to jump in there. You mentioned that your dad was kind of like against the transition from uh, Catholicism to the you know Jehovah Witness you know theology. Did did he come along at any point, or was he just defiant the entire time? Because it said, seems like your mom doubled down on her faith. You well, know, and so in, initially they both started studying with the witnesses. Uh, but when it came down to making changes like uh, not celebrating anything, my dad mm. was not down with that. Mm. You know, we used okay. to celebrate Christmas, birthday parties, everything. 
And then uh, he just didn't like that. Um, so he, he told my mom, either you stop studying or I'm going to send you guys to Mexico. And that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And she did do double you, down. Well, and, you know, um, I, I think that for a lot of us, you know, the, uh, what goes on in the household influences a lot of who we become as, as an adult, you know, whether you embrace it even more or whether you rebel against it, you know, do you feel like, like your religious upbringing, you know, had had anything to do with your art? You know, did that have any kind of impact on your art? Uh, Well, for one, yes, because it, 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 it kind of like forced me to draw since I didn't have any friends, you know, I would just stay home and draw all the time. So in, in that way, yes, it influenced it a lot. And also, when I was a Jehovah Witness, my aspirations uh, were back in those days to uh, work for the organization and uh, do art for them. Because a lot of their books, I don't know if you're familiar with their books. I they're am. Full of, they're, they're full of artwork. Yes. And, elaborate, and, too. Yeah. Colorful and, and exactly. elaborate. And, and it depicts, you know, very important scenes, you know, exactly. historical scenes. Or, yeah, definitely familiar with it. Yeah. So though all those books influenced me a lot and they inspired mm-hmm. me because that was that was pretty much my only uh, uh, exposure to art growing up. And also I used to sneak into the Catholic churches to look at their the paintings that were on the wall. That was my exposure to going to art shows or museums. So yes, it, it it was a huge influence. No, oh, okay. And uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt the flow of things. I just thought it was important, you know, to kind of capture no, a little good. bit of, of who you are today. All right. So uh, you were born um, in the States. You were born in Glendale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at some point, you know, uh, your family moved to uh, Mexico. And then, you you know, you had, I believe you're nine, nine or 10, somewhere around there uh, when you uh, moved to Mexico. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How long were you there before you came back? Because I know like you, part of your upbringing was also in Mexico. And I imagine that was maybe a tough transition, you know, uh, going, it's a big cultural change from Glendale, California to maybe a small village in, in Mexico. It was a huge, it was a huge shock. I mean, I, I was already, because we would go to Mexico to visit our grandparents and everything and we loved it. So I was already familiar with it, but to go down there to live and to experience that, you know, you're, you, you live in Glendale, you go to a nice school and then you get that yanked out and then you go to a rancho where the school is just, is just ugly. Yeah. They, their, their desk is just like, you know, they're falling apart. The buildings have no windows. Right. You've got insects, iguanas, lizards, wow. uh, avispas, like all over you. So it, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a shock. Definitely. And, and aparte from that, as a Jehovah witness, you're not supposed to salute the flag. So me and my sisters weren't participating in that. So we were looked at like, Oh, you guys are the enemy. Like, mm. why don't you salute the flag? And uh, they just d- didn't understand. And they looked at us like, like we were uh, foreign people not like that. Even our own family would like talk bad about us and to our faces. Were you, uh, do you feel like you were ostracized because of that? Oh, big time. Yeah. 100%. And I I imagine, yeah, definitely, you know, uh, I would say majority of, you know, culture in, in Mexico and Mexico is definitely rooted, deeply rooted in Catholicism. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, coming into that world, having different views, uh, I could see how others, especially kids, you know, kids are sometimes uh, very judgmental, very, very, very vicious, you know, without really understanding much. Uh, so I imagine, yeah, that must that must have been tough, you know, staying true to who your family is and also trying to assimilate into this new environment. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, Jehovah Witnesses get killed in Mexico for really? being Jehovah mm-hmm. Witnesses. Wow. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of things happened to us when we were preaching door to door. You know, people would unleash their dogs on us. They would come out with their guns pointing at us and, you know, throwing us out, slamming doors on us, throwing throwing hot water, uh, salsa at us, eggs. Wow. That, walking that's... down the street. 
people yelling names at you. They call they usually call uh, Jehovah Witnesses Jehovistas down there, or uh, devil worshippers. And most of the houses out there, they have a sign at the door specifically saying, "If you're a Jehovah Witness, do not knock on this door." Right, right. Yeah. So it's a it was a hostile environment for you, and then they, yeah. I imagine as a teenager, I mean, you know. Being a teenager, I feel anywhere in the world is already a hostile environment. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to figure out who you are. Everybody's trying to figure out who they are. And it's just a lot of clashes, you know, of, of egos and identities. But for you, I feel like it was like up a notch, you know, because then you had to deal with that other factor of, you know, uh, uh, your, uh, your your religion. Um, so that, that that's, that's really interesting. Um, do you feel like that made you more resilient in some ways or, or, or it had, there has to have been some good that came from those experiences, even though at the time they're probably not pleasant, maybe even some traumatic, you know, some growth had to come from that. Right. What, what do you think you, you learned? Absolutely. Um, it, it, you know, it helps you grow thick skin. So uh, eventually when I started my business, and as you know, you know, when you have your own business, you experience a lot of rejection Yeah, and you learn how to uh, not react other uh, or yeah, not react. So instead of reacting, you use that as a stepping stone to achieve more. So, yeah, it definitely did teach me. And like you said, back when I was experiencing the, all this, I didn't know anything about that. But as I grew older, you know, rejection was like nothing for me. Good, good. Well, um, you know, there was a lot of growth, even though it was trial by fire, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately, I think that that's most of the time, that's how we learn is through failure, through setbacks, you know, through unpleasant experiences like that, because if, if, uh, if you want to progress, you got to adapt and, you know, try to find the silver lining in things, you know. Um, so you went to Mexico, you had this experience that definitely had to change your worldview. You, and then you came back to the States. At what point did you really dive deep into the art? Because I know you're a creative person already and you had some raw talent. At what point did, did that become more of a, of a deeper passion that, that turned into a profession for you? Uh, well, so we came back in the year of 1989. And uh, coming back, I, I got some jobs. I got a job right away with an uh, uncle uh, doing construction. And then I eventually got a job at a liquor store slash uh, deli in Glendale down the street from my house. And I was there for about two years. When I turned 18, I quit because uh, I wanted to go to uh, school to study art. So uh, in in that uh, time, when I was thinking about what school to go to, I went to an agency and I I told them, you know what, I, I want temp jobs uh, because I'm going to go to school eventually. So I don't want, I'm not looking for anything permanent, but one of the jobs turned out to be a Disney, uh, job and it was supposed to be for five days only. And it was down the street from my house. I used to take my bike down there. Uh, so during those five days when I was there, I got to know some of the people and I, I met an artist and we started talking and he told me that, uh, they were thinking about starting an inking department. And I asked him, you know, show me what it is. And he did. And I'm like, dude, I can do that. And he's like, well, go talk to our boss. So I immediately went to him, uh, Steve Wetzel, and I asked him, look, I'm an artist and I hear about your inking department. I'd like to try out for it. And he's like, all right, well, tomorrow we'll do a test. So it came back tomorrow. I, they had me inking some Winnie the Poohs. I passed it and I was the first inker they hired. So then What's uh, an inker? What, what's inking? I mean, I, I can kind of imagine, but you know, there's got to be some people that are like, what, what's he talking about? Um, so, if, some... if when you look, when you look at the cartoon, it's the line work, the outline, okay, right? That's the inking part. Okay. Um, in animation, uh, all the line work happened on top of the cell, and then you flip the cell, and it gets painted on the back, and then that mm. cell gets inserted into the camera and gets shot, and that's what we used to see on on film. That's, right, right. This is the old way animation was done. Right. So this this department, what what they were doing is they were keeping they were set, they were actually selling these cells after they used them to film. They were selling them uh, in galleries, but they wow. were restoring them. Uh, you know, some of the line work was falling off. So our job was to just go there and repair that. I see. I see. It was easy stuff. And, 
and and the cell for people that aren't familiar as well with that i mean that that's just like a, like a clear film right that they, exactly. they would then photograph and i don't know if any of you have maybe drawn a little little running stick figure on the on the corner of a book or something like that and just flip through it and then that gives it the animation because you know it, it's movement in every other page so i think that's the way animation used to work right i mean it, it, all individual cells photographed and then just ran uh at a certain frames frame per speed uh you know frames per second exactly it's a it's a 23 uh cells that make up a second wow so for example snow white took took about four hundred thousand cells to make that's a lot of lot, that's a lot of inking that's a lot, a of, lot work. of work Good. You had job security <laughs> uh, back then. Yeah. All right. So you, you got into Disney and yeah. uh, at some point you imagine they liked your work and how, how did your you know uh, career continue to build? So, so I was in that department for about six, seven months. And then the main inking department at, at, at the Disney company, they needed anchors and uh, anchors don't exist anywhere. But they knew about our department. It was about, you know, the department grew as big as like 25 anchors. They came over, tested all of us, and they picked me out. So I started working for the main lot um, in 94. So then uh, working in that, in that department for years, I, I learned that the company does uh, art shows for employees. And I went to one of the art shows and at that time, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the art world and how it worked. I don't know about museums, art galleries, none of that. So that was my very first time being exposed at so, something like that. And I was, it just made a huge impression on me. You know, I walked, I walked in there and I saw a bunch of artwork on the wall and there was a lot of people there. Some people were buying it. Um, so that, that whole thing intrigued me and it motivated me to, um, work on my personal artwork to get it in there. So I worked at it for years and then I eventually got in one of the shows and I got a good response from the public. And, uh, from that point on, I just started building my portfolio because I, now I wanted to pitch it to outside galleries. But during that time, a friend of mine introduces me to uh, a, a famous graffiti artist. And at that time he was curating art shows. Well, I meet him and then he started, he puts me in a show, uh, January, 2005. And then from that point on, you know, my, our career just took off. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember the name of the artist? The yeah. graffiti artist? Uh, Retina. Retina. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm not super familiar with the graffiti world. I mean, I, I have, you know, a couple of friends, you know, that are heavy into it. And, you know, I know there's a couple of crews out there and, you know, in, in LA and, you know, really throughout Southern California. So I imagine he's one of those guys up there, you know, um, oh, he's, he's probably uh, the, the top graffiti artist. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. We'll definitely have to check out his work. Yeah. All right. So, so you continue to get more exposure. You continue to up your game. At, at what point do you think you develop your own identity? Uh, because, you know, in, in my assessment uh, of your art, you know, there, there's a couple of, you know, di different styles that you're blending into it. And what, what would you say that is? What, what, what do you feel is, you know, your what makes you different or unique from uh, other artists out there? Um, well, at, as far as technique, I'm a hyper realist. You know, I, I, I make my pencil drawings. Well, I used to not anymore. I used to make them look like photos. And, and that was in some ways, it was an issue because I would enter my pieces into competitions and judges thought would think it was a photo. So they're like, oh, what's special about this? And then right. it, it happened so many times, you know, after the competition, I would get an email or a call from the director and they're like, you know, the judges thought your piece was a photo. So they didn't even consider it. So yeah. eventually, and, and, you know, at the beginning of my career, I was drawing celebrities and then I went. Uh, I, I left that and then I started uh, more diving into telling my own personal story. So what I did is I toned it down with uh, technical skills and I, uh, I was picking images from my family's uh, photo albums. And my whole uh, idea was to uh, document my family's migration from Mexico as as a person that migrated to Mexico and then back to the States. So I'm pretty familiar on, on what immigrants go through. Yeah. Especially because my parents were, um, so that's, that's the, that's the first, 
serious uh, body of work that I started working on. And I think that's that's what I'm known for in the in the art world is uh, depicting uh, imagery from my family's uh, photo album as far as that. Now, now looking at the artwork behind you, um, the, there's a, there's a blend between your your hyper realist approach and you know the uh, cartoon animation. I mean, you're going from you know pencil and paper to acrylics and you know color. Um, when when did that style come into play? I mean, you you, you have one behind you, for example. Of uh, let's take uh, El Chapulín, you know. Or El, este, you have Popeye, you have Elmer Fudd, and then to the right of it or left of it, there's a pencil uh, drawing. How did that come about? So that this this series is very recent. Um, I did I started this about a year and a half ago. Okay. And so the whole idea behind it is that. I'm blending what I'm uh, good at, which is pencil portraiture with what I've been doing at Disney for 30 years. Mm, the ink so I'm blending those two worlds in and I'm still, it's still continuing uh, to tell that immigration story of my family because all those, all the pencil uh, pieces there are either myself or my family. Okay. And, and then all the cartoons uh, they represent what I've been doing at Disney, not Disney characters, but what I've been doing uh, since I was 19. And uh, it's it's basically, you know, cartoons that I grew up with, cartoons that I were I was I've been influenced. And it they range from, you know, Superman, Elmer Fudd to El Chapulín Colorado, because I lived in Mexico for 10 years. Right, right. And are, are those actual cells? Yes. Mm hmm. So each one of those cells was in, in a Disney cartoon or animation. And then you, you just added your piece to it. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I, from, from the uh, works that you have on, I mean, you, you have a lot of, you know, really good work. One of uh, my most favorite one is La Mujer. Um, I just, I don't know. It's, it's something that I enjoy doing. I think it's because I like the, uh, the, the motion, the action of the two gallos kind of fighting. And then the other side is just interesting. You know, who, who is that? Who is La, La Mujer? Does she have a gun on her hip? Yeah, she does. She, okay. She, she was my aunt. Okay. Wow. Your, yeah. your aunt wasn't one to be messed with. Seems like, she, you know, she, <laughs> <laughs> she, she could wield a gun. Okay. So these are the portraits that you're talking about. And mm -hmm. then you, you blended the style with the acrylics and the, and the pencil. Exactly. And I'm, I'm not trying to brag about this, but I, I might be the only artist that's doing this combination of pencil realism with animation art. And I mean, then, it's the first time I've seen it and, yeah. you know, it, it's very appealing. It's intriguing. Uh, I haven't seen it anywhere else. So, you know, I, I like it. Like I said, that that one just uh, just really caught my eye uh, for the subjects that you chose. Um uh, on on the uh, on on the actual work, I mean, she seems like very confident. You know, she she's got that gun next to her hip, and then you have all this action of these two gallos just going at it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, la mujer. Um, do you have any particular pieces that for you are like special in in one way that you know maybe one specific way, like maybe this person is no longer around, or is it remember it, uh, it commemorates like a certain time in your life. I mean, is there any kind of other artworks that we can look at that? Um, um that you really yeah. like yeah if you go to my website um it my the first series that i did on uh, what's your website on antoniopelayo.com okay uh look up the album um um mi familia okay and that's that's the first series where i i started getting serious with my uh storytelling and uh, uh, our, uh there's two pieces there one called historia sin tiempo and it's a portrait of my dad and his cousin and they both already, they passed away uh, recently, actually. And they were best friends. They died almost, they, they died like a year, two years apart. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, that piece in particular depicts them two uh, in El Rancho celebrating because they were deported from here. They, you know, from L.A., they got deported mm -hmm. back like in, I believe, early 70s. So they get deported, they go straight to El Rancho. And it, it's like, you know, they their idea to come to the States was just to come and make money because um, in Mexico there, you 
you do uh, have, you work, but you don't make a lot of money. I mean, if you want to compare the numbers, uh, a worker in Mexico might make like a hundred bucks a month. And you come here, you get a job at a restaurant, you might make 500 bucks or a thousand dollars a month. So the compare, the, the amounts is just, it's, it's, it's large. So their idea was to come to Me to come here to work, make money, go back and live in Mexico. So every time they had a chance to go visit, you know, it was like a, a dream come true, <laughs> yeah. even if they got deported. Right. <laughs> hey, they got a free trip home. Right. I mean, exactly. that's probably what they were thinking. <laughs> exactly. So there was that 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 piece right there um, um, just depicts their their celebration. Yeah. Now, um, aside from being, uh, you know, employed by Disney, which is, you know, uh, for someone who's a creative, who's an artist, I imagine, you know, it, it's a it's a good breeding ground, right, for for more opportunities. Um, to also being an artist, um, you've also ventured into the world of event organizing, right? You've put on shows, you've put on your own shows, art gallery, um, art shows, and also other kind of events. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how did you get into that world? So um, me exhibiting my work in galleries, I, I started getting a lot of people, aside from friends, asking me for advice on how to get their art out there. Um, and eventually people started suggesting, you know, you should curate your own shows. And I thought about it. And then, uh, one, one day, um, a friend of mine that was doing, uh, events at clubs and bars asked me, Hey, do you know, you want to invite a few of your friends and, you, you know, you can exhibit your work yourself. And I said, you know, well, yeah, let's give it a try. So I invited a couple of my friends and they framed up their work and we showed it at a bar and it, it was like a hit. And uh, we, we did that for about a year. And then um, eventually I, I said, you know what, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to do maybe one event a year, but I want to combine uh, live music with art. That was the two main elements. And then I chose Day of the Dead because I'm, you know, I'm familiar with the, with the tradition. And I had a friend that had a bar lounge in, uh, in L.A. by the Staples Center. So I pitched them the idea and, and I told them, you know, uh, what do you think about doing a Day of the Dead event at your spot? And he loved it. And I did it. So I, I uh, launched in Velorio in 2010 at Sabor Lounge by, by uh, Staples Center. I had about 22 visual artists. I had a DJ. Uh, we, did, uh, we had face painting, food, drinks. And I, I think about 300 people showed up and everybody had a good time. And then after that, um, everyone was like, you know, you're going to bring it back next year. Yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah. And, and I said, yes, but I want to, I, I, my idea is not to jump on the bandwagon of day of the dead. Cause as, as you know, there's like thousands of events now here in LA. Uh, I, I did, I just didn't want to be another event. So my idea was, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to uh, raise money for nonprofits that have to do with teaching arts to kids. So that's what I've been doing. You know, every, every event that I do is, is, is a, a way to raise funds for organizations like that. And I've, I've raised funds for about five organizations in my 11, 12 years of doing this thing. So that's how it got started. And now, you know, as you saw at Velori, we had about, I don't know, maybe like 4,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was a, it was an awesome event. Uh, there was a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of aesthetic value to to the show. Uh, there was a lot of people dressed up, you know, with whatever their own interpretations of, of you know, the Dia de los Muertos, you know, uh, uh, holiday, uh, the, the the stage, you know, I, I mean, the paper machés. I mean, there was so much going on, you know, and then I think you had uh, vendors. I mean, you had a lot of a lot of things going on. So I'm definitely looking forward to uh, going back. But uh, tell us a little bit about that event. I mean, um, who was it hosted by? And, you know, what, what was your takeaway from this most recent event, which I think was your first one since the whole, you know, pandemic thing happened. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I was the first one after two years and it, and it happened because a friend of mine um, knew the owners of Pico Rivera, uh, the sports arena. And he, he asked me if uh, I'd be down to do it there because where, where I, I, I've done them since 2013 Plaza de la Rasta in East LA. 
they weren't having any events. So I said, you know what, you know, why not? Let's do it. But um, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to like um, been able to attract like a lot of big names like Danny Trejo, Alicia Del Valle. Um, the, the whole idea when I started this was I wanted to feature emerging artists. And then it got, it got so big that I started attracting like big names. Uh, I've, I've had uh, in my show, like, you know, uh, the legend F Freddie Negretti, Mark Mahoney, I mean, you name it, Franco Vescovi, um, Nick Hurtado, uh, big names in the fine art world like Salomon Huerta, uh, Carlos Ramirez, no. Frank, Ro Frank Romero, like That's all right. these big names. Right. They, they asked me if, you know, they could be a part of it. And I'm like, really? All right. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's one, one of those is Danny Trejo. You know, he, he's, uh, he's been, uh, uh, willingly wanting to host my events. El Velorio was the, fir the fourth event that he's hosted alongside with Alicia Del Valle. Yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been, uh, I've been very fortunate, um, and uh blessed uh, to have the support of all these big names yeah yeah there was a lot a lot of celebrities on hand uh the the music was great the environment was great there's also food vendors you know and you just had a lot going on so it was definitely a very pleasurable time for myself definitely enjoyed it i will definitely be back Uh, for any of you that missed it this year, I mean, don't sleep on it next year because it's only going to get better every year, especially now that, you know, you're, you're continuing to, to grow uh, your, your connections and your relationships with, with people that, that um, put this event together. You also um, have kind of, I would say, maybe even doubled down on your events, right? Uh, you, you were doing one or a couple events a year and now you're twice as much, right? So yeah. tell me so a little bit about your other events that you uh, that you put on um well the the two main ones i do is el velorio el velorio i've been doing it uh that 11 years skip 2020 and then la bulla uh it's a lucha libre event that i started in 2015 and we just uh did it december first week of december and we have the next one scheduled for february but due to covid we pushed it to march So uh, we, we plan on doing La Bulla. I teamed up with a group of people that, that have a location in Long Beach. Um, we're going to do it there five times this year. And then one time at Plaza de la Raza in, in, uh, in August. What's the focus of that event? Uh, to show Lucha Libre, right? Yeah, to showcase the, the Lucha Libre culture. So do you have matches? Yeah, yeah. Oh. We, have, we have about two hours of live Lucha Libre. That's cool. Uh, the, the idea behind that one is that we uh, pay tribute to a legend luchador. So, for example, I've had I've had Mil Mascaras. I've had uh, Blue wow. Demon. And we bring that wrestler here uh, so he can see um, his tribute. Right. Uh, That's it, awesome. It, yeah. The art show is typically what we do is we make these masks cut out of their mask. And each artist does their thing on, on each piece. So we have about 150 to 200 pieces. And then when uh, the legend walks through there, they're like blown away. Right. They see all these, all these artwork and every single one of us unique and different and awesome. So they're blown away. So, so, so with the event, I mean, not only are you paying tribute to the uh, el, el Luchador, you're also You know, paying tribute, which something is, is a very uh, deep ingrained part of Mexican culture, which is la lucha libre. But you're also throwing art back into that. Yeah, absolutely. Not only that, but we also have a fashion show, uh, con concert part. Uh, there's been times when we screen movies and documentaries. So all these things that make up this culture, they're all, you know, packed in one night. Right. So what's next? What's next? What, what, what's the next big, you know, uh, game changer for Antonio Pelayo? I mean, you're, you're already doing big things, but I mean, uh, from what I've seen, uh, you're always evolving. So what, what can we expect coming down the road? Taking it national. We're, we're looking at uh, taking La Buya to New York, Houston, Chicago, possibly Mexico. So that, that, I think that's the next 
next level. So stay posted, you know, to a city near you, La Buya. Now, what, what about El Velorio? Is that something that's going to stay Southern Cali? I mean, are, are we going to be special and we're going to keep that here or, or will we see yeah. El Velorio somewhere else? No, I think I think uh, we're going to keep El Velorio at, at Plaza de la Raza. That's where it flourished. Uh, the director, Maria, allowed me to uh, do a lot of things and, ex and experiment. And it's grown there and it's flourished there. And I think it belongs in, in East L.A. So that's right. Yeah. Um, all right. If someone wants to follow up with, you know, what's going on with uh, yourself in regards to your art and your events, you know, what's the best place for someone to, you know, to follow up with you? I think the best place is uh, Instagram. Okay. My my personal art Instagram is Antonio Pelayo. Uh, if you want to follow uh, El Velorio on Instagram and La Buya on Instagram, those three okay. right there. Okay. Well, I appreciate you making the time to join us. Uh, you know, I would like to have you back in the future. Any last words for the viewers? Absolutely, bro. Um, you know, thank you for having me. Um, you know, it, it, when people ask me for advice, I always tell them, look, find something that you love and just work hard at it. And whatever bumps you come across, you just go through them. Simple. All right. Simple. Keep, keep it simple. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, good uh, words of advice from Antonio Pelayo. And he definitely has a, a big resume to back that up. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. We, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you, uh, hopefully down the road and, and get you back on the show if you're interested. Thank you. Anyone out there, uh, you know, don't sleep on, on Antonio and his events and his artwork. Go, go check him out. You heard the Instagram. Um, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, you're listening to Chicano Rap Radio, raw and uncut. Chicano Rap Radio, raw and uncut. uncut.